Now, to understand how the static enforcement works, let's have a look at the type system. The RT-Loader type system is twofold. We have value types and we have pacing types. Value types are just the regular old type you know from pretty much any type language. It states the shape and interpretation of a value. So for example, if a value has type in 64, then we have to interpret it as an integer, and it consists of 64 bits. Pacing types, however, are far less common in, in programming languages, and uh, TLOLA pacing types come in two different shapes. It is either periodic or event-based. Periodic types are pretty much uh, easy to understand. If a stream has the peri periodic type 1 hertz, then we only compute it once per second. And if it has 6 hertz, then we compute it 6 times per second. Pretty straightforward. The number of potential periodic types for a certain specification is bounded because there are a couple of peri periods annotated in a specification and the remaining, remaining potential periods are just combinations of these uh, periods. So here we have a bounded set. Periodic types are only concerned with the real time. They are completely independent of events. And the um, polar opposite of this are event types. They have nothing to do with the real time. They are only concerned with new input events we get. So if a stream has the periodic B event based type A or B, for example, where A and B are input streams, then we evaluate the stream when either A or B receives a new value. And similarly, if the event based time would be A and B, then we only evaluate the stream if both A and B get a new value at the same point in time. So that's the idea behind event types. And the different types um, dictate how streams can access other streams. Let's have a look at an example. Let's say we have four streams, two event streams, and two periodic streams. We can see that the stream P2 is evaluated twice as often as P1. That means if P1 accesses P2 synchronously, that means we access whenever we evaluate P1, we access the latest value of P2, which has to be computed at the same point in time. So this works out if P1 accesses P2 synchronously, because we know whenever P1 is computed, P2 will also be computed. The other way around, however, does not work, because if P2 wants to access P1 period um, synchronously, then this does not necessarily work out, because only half of the time, at every other computation, um, P1 also gets a new value. Thus, half of the computations would fail, and this is just not allowed in RT loader. If we still wanted to access such a value, even though there is no value, then we would need to have an asynchronous um, lookup. Most prominently, this is necessary if you want to access an event-based stream from a periodic stream. So for example, if P1 accesses E1, then it needs, needs to use an asynchronous lookup, for example, a zero order hold. In this case, it just checks what is the latest value of E1 we have and uses this one. And this access is fallible because if E1 has never produced a value, then there is no value to, to sample from. So such an asynchronous offset or asynchronous lookup needs to provide a default value if the access fails. A different kind of asynchronous offset and lookup is, uh, can be seen in this illustration for P2 and E2. So here P2 accesses E2 asynchronously with a sliding window expression. So what a sliding window expression does is it states a frame of time and every value of the event-based stream within this frame of time will be aggregated with some aggregation function. And this is the value where P2 gets access to. And this does not work for all possible aggregation functions, but only for list homomorphisms. I don't want to go into too much detail about um, which aggregations work here. Suffice it to say that most interesting aggregation functions do work. So for example, integration, averaging, or computation of variance, but not all of them. The median, for example, or any percentile function does not work as a list homomorphism. So here we could not use these aggregation functions. The bottom line for all of this is that there are synchronous lookups, and these are the default 
in Lula. So if you just write that P1 accesses P2, it's meant to be a synchronous lookup. And such synchronous lookups couple the timing, and they are infallible because they enforce that the other stream is definitely um, also evaluated at the same point in time. As opposed to this, we have the asynchronous lookups like um, hold operations and aggregations. They decouple timing and are fallible because we don't know whether the value uh, we access is actually there. And lastly, we have aggregations, and these aggregations are only permitted in periodic streams as I outlined before. Great, now let's see the type system in action. For this, uh, let's go back to our sensor value validation uh, for the altimeter. Here we can see that the input stream altitude has the annotated value type float32, and the pacing type for each input is, um, is clear because it is just the input itself. And this type is more or less tautological because it just says altitude will get a new value if altitude gets a new value. So this makes kind of sense. For the trigger, we know that we access the altitude value, which is the float, and we compare it against zero. So the result is a Boolean value, which is required for triggers. And the timing is coupled to altitude because we access it synchronously. So the, the type of the trigger is Boolean altitude. And this is kind of critical here because the type, uh, the pacing type is coupled to altitude, which ensures timeliness because whenever altitude gets a new value, we immediately evaluate a trigger condition and get given output. And this ensures that we, we cannot just uh, wait with the evaluation here. Okay, let's consider the second uh, sensor validation for the barometer. Once again, the input stream is a float 32 and the timing is itself. And the output stream here um, performs some counting. Counting will always result in an unsigned integer value. And the pacing is the annotated pacing here of 1 hertz. So the type is u in 32 and 1 hertz. The trigger expression then accesses read ps twice, meaning that it couples its timing to the 1 hertz and it produces a Boolean value because it compares it against, um, against constants. Great, now let's have a look at two more outputs. Suppose we have an output x, which just aggregates the um, pressure stream somehow. This would immediately be rejected because it's an aggregation without, the, without an evaluation period or frequency, so this is not possible. And the output y would multiply the number of uh, readings we got per second with the uh, pressure value for whatever reason. Point here is this would also not be allowed because it mixes periodics and event-based types. So these are rejected. Now let's have a look at a cross-sensor validation. So let's say we have two different readings for velocity, velocity 1, velocity 2, um, and we want to see how far they deviate. So what we would do is we write an output stream deviation, and this computes the absolute difference between velocity 1 and velocity 2. Now implicitly, since deviation accesses both input streams, the pacing type of deviation would be the conjunction of both. So we only evaluate deviation when we get a new value for velocity 1 and velocity 2 at the same time. And sometimes, sometimes this is exactly what we want, but sometimes it isn't. So what if we wanted to evaluate deviation when we get either velocity 1 or velocity 2? In this case, we could just annotate this explicitly by saying we have an output deviation prime with the pacing velocity 1 or velocity 2. However, we also have to adapt the uh, expression a little bit because now what's happening is if we get, suppose this is the first time we ever get an event, and there's only velocity 1 in there. Now we cannot compute deviation prime because we have a value for velocity 1, but none for velocity 2. And the other way around if we only had a new value for velocity 2. So to compensate for this, we have we as a specifier have to define what exactly we want to have, what behavior we want to have in this case. So here we could, for example, use the hold operation instead. Uh, which decouples the timing, and we have to supply a default value for this. In this case here, it's, uh, it's zero. For the type system, what's happening is the sub-expressions here would get the, the um, expected value type, and the pacing type is any, because hold does not impose any pacing, so any 
states, well, we have no idea what kind of timing we want to have. It can be anything. In fact, the whole expression of deviation prime has the pacing any. And thus, the uh, Artillery forces the specifier to also state what the timing is supposed to be. Because if, if the expression does not yield any information on the timing, we don't know when to evaluate deviation prime, so the specifier has to supply this information. And what this really shows is that the strong type system supports the specifier in their quest of specifying what they have in mind. And this increases the confidence in the specification. It's really similar to different programming languages where a strong type system forces the, the, the programmer to really state and think about what they want to express. And thus, if they find um, a piece of code, or in this case, a specification that goes through the type system, the type checker, then we have some confidence that the specification cannot be completely wrong. Okay, so, so much about the type system. Before we go on with a more involved example of Ortilola, um, you once again have a chance to ask questions.